as Bitcoin gets the higher layers, it has to reach into more types of capital. Right. So if you're if you're if there's just like, say, 30 million, 30 trillion dollars in, in managed assets that just can't touch Bitcoin and it's in these walled gardens, then that kind of limits what Bitcoin reach in a given cycle. Right. Because those assets are not going to come out of those walled gardens. And so the, to the extent that Bitcoin can penetrate into those walled gardens, that's relevant. Um, and so I, I, I hesitate to put a number on it. Hey guys, welcome back to Everyday Finance. In this video, Lynn Alden discusses crypto and Bitcoin according to Lynn Alden. If Bitcoin continues to grow, it will need to expand into higher layers. There are different types of capital. For example, if there's around $30 trillion in circulation, there are assets that cannot compare to Bitcoin. And when they are within closed ecosystems, it limits Bitcoin's potential. Given that the cycle is correct, because those assets are not going to come out of those walled gardens to the extent that Bitcoin has the potential to break into closed ecosystems, which is significant. Lynn Alden cautious about making specific predictions, but the possibilities are there. Simply put, the answer is elevated, higher than it would typically be. If there are any concerns about Bitcoin, feel free to share them up until now. There has been a pattern of decreasing returns, they are still high, but decreasing with each cycle. If you consider the high and low points of each cycle and use multiples of the previous cycle's high or low, you can make more informed decisions. There are a couple of different ways to measure how big a cycle is, but according to most of them, you've experienced diminishing returns. One surprising aspect that could break the consensus is if you receive an upward trend surpassing a previous one which is quite unprecedented, and lots of things Lynn Alden discussed, so please watch the video to end. And like, share this video, and subscribe our channel, Everyday Finance, thanks. So I think that, it, so gold parity is kind of a meme that like our space cares about, um, but that the average person is like, what are you, what are you talking about, right? Like, like, they don't know the market cap of gold, they don't know the market cap of Bitcoin, they don't know the relevance of that. Um, if anything, the funny thing is you, before you hit um, gold market cap parity, you surpass the U.S. monetary base, right? So if, if Bitcoin is a bigger monetary, right now it's something like the sixth biggest monetary base, which is base money, not broad money. Obviously, U.S. broad money is way bigger than than gold. Um, but the if you pass the base money, that's I mean that's a fascinating talk. But even if you're like number two or three up from like number six right now, whatever the number is, if you pa if you're up there with like China and Europe, uh, in terms of like the biggest monetary bases in the world, that's fascinating uh, uh, data point. Um, I, I think one of the biggest things is one, seeing it not die multiple times. So most of us in the space have looked at the long-term logarithmic chart where you see all the cycles of Bitcoin. You have to keep in mind that most people have not seen that chart, right? That's that's in our echo chamber, we see that chart all the time. Uh, I, I think you even have that chart behind you with the colors. Like you can kind of see Bitcoin price uh, on it um, exactly. to some extent. So we've seen that chart and charts like it. Most people have not. They've only they've seen the, the price rises that occurred within their conception of paying attention to it, which, for example, might have been the 2017 bull run and then might have been the 2021 bull run. So they saw a big bubble and then they saw another big bubble that was bigger and they often view it in linear chart. So it either looks like a bubble or a broken bubble and they don't know that there's been prior cycles before that. Um, and so I, I think people often wake up when they see like the third rise within their um, span of paying attention to the asset that they've personally seen like it not die three times, for example. Um, I think that's a big kind of signpost. Um, another one is just that the, the relevance where the size matters is that when more people hold it uh, and when it become, when when lawmakers are talking about it, I mean, certainly the size has caught a lot of their attention for, for sometimes good, sometimes bad reasons. Um, you know, I, I think overall academics will be paying attention to it because it's a larger and larger asset and it's a larger, larger part of the discussion and it's not considered fringe. So if you write a research paper on it, uh, you know, you're not going to like, be told, why are you working on that niche thing, right? It's like, no, I'm, I'm working on something that's the size of the U.S. monetary base, for example. That would be, that'd be a relevant thing. Um, in general, you don't see a lot, you don't see academics change their mind very often. Um, it, it's different than a business context. Normally kind of people rotate out of the profession uh one way or another and other people rotate in right so it's i don't think it's a surprise that um the professors that are working on that resistance money book are on the younger side of professors 
you know, I don't know their exact ages, but they're they're not, you know, they're not gray haired professors, even though ironically, there's there's plenty of, of of older people that really appreciate Bitcoin. But generally in the academic circles, new ideas or new things tend to come from the younger side of of, of professors. Um, so I think it's a lot of it's just rotating. It's just time. It's, you know, five, 10, 15 years of some people rotating out, more people rotating in the asset getting bigger and therefore uh, more normal to talk about the Overton window shifting over time. That, that's really how I approach it. Whereas business stuff, because, you know, it, you have kind of an objective measuring stick uh, of profit um, that tends to pivot a little bit sooner than than more um, narrative driven or model driven or you know, it's intellectually driven types of work. According to Lynn Alden, the gold parody is akin to a meme that our the normal individual is like, what are you talking about? And doesn't seem to care about space, know the market value of gold. But they are unaware of the market value of Bitcoin, and they are unsure of its significance. If anything, the amusing part is that you previously... When you cross the US monetary base, you reach a gold market cap parody. Therefore, if Bitcoin is a larger monet at the moment, it would be around the sixth largest monetary base, which is definitely not broad money like us. Wide money is much larger than gold, to be sure. But if you pass the base money, that's still an interesting discussion. If you're up there with like China and Europe, you're like two or three up from like number six right now. Whatever the number is of the world's largest financial bases, which is amazing. This is Lynn Alden Believe, one of the biggest since most of us in the area have seen creatures not die repeatedly when considering the long-term logarithmic chart that displays all of Bitcoin cycles. Bear in mind that the majority of people have not seen it. Let's back to the Lynn Alden interview. I think that's really hard to say, but I think that if, if so, as Bitcoin gets the higher layers, it has to reach into more types of capital. Right. So if you're if you're if there's just like, say, 30 million, 30 trillion dollars in, in managed assets that just can't touch Bitcoin and it's in these walled gardens, then that kind of limits what Bitcoin reach in a given cycle. Right. Because those assets are not going to come out of those walled gardens. And so the, to the extent that Bitcoin can penetrate into those walled gardens, that's relevant. Um, and so I, I, I hesitate to put a number on it, but it's just the answer is higher. Right. It's just higher than it would otherwise be. And if there's anything. So so Bitcoin is so far had a history of diminishing returns, still high returns, but diminishing returns. That every cycle, if you if you take the cycle high and and, mul and do a multiple of the, the prior cycle high, um, or you do um, say the cycle low to the cycle high, there's a couple of different ways to measure how big a cycle is. But a according to most of them, you've had diminishing returns. Uh, one of the surprising things, kind of a consensus breaker would be if you get a, a cycle that is higher than a prior cycle. Uh, that's never really happened before. And I, I'm still agnostic if that's going to happen this time or not. But one of the fa if it does happen, one of the factors that that I think would be relevant for making it happen is the ETFs. Uh, if there's something that helps to surprise the upside, I think last cycle surprised most people to the downside. Like the high, the high was not quite as high as some people were hoping. The low was lower than people were hoping, even though it was a much higher high and a much higher low than the cycle before it. Um, but if you were to kind of surprise to the upside in a cycle, I think ETFs are are one of the major variables that would probably need. I think that's part of it. Yeah, there was, is, I mean, it's, it's well known now that there was some rehypothecation. Um, and that's, I mean, that's a threat to any financial asset. Um, and so that's, you know, we, like FTX was something like 1.8 1. billion, you know, naked short Bitcoin um, uh, dollars worth. Um, and there were other entities in a similar boat. So I, I do think that was a muting factor. Um, I think a potentially other muting factor was that across the whole, across multiple asset classes, there was extreme uh, speculation, right? So equities were um, across the board reaching like speculative mania, um, especially like unprofitable tech stocks and meme stocks. We all knew that cycle. And then that, of course, extended into the altcoin realm, which happens in every cycle so far. Um, but that was a particularly noisy segment. Um, and so I, I think if anything, the, the proliferation of altcoins probably muted Bitcoin's high more so than some of these specific entities um but that it all kind of plays a role together so i think i think that would have been more of an issue maybe 10 years ago like when when the winglevoss twins originally proposed a bitcoin etf which was a good thing i mean it was made sense for them to do so they were they were early on this whole um uh you know kind of asset um but if that had happened 
you can imagine a case where a lot of the Bitcoins wound up in ETFs. Um, fortunately, now Bitcoin's had 15 years to kind of distribute. Um, and so it's pretty hard to get the genie back in the bottle and pull a lot of those coins back into very centralized custody. Um, you know, using GBTC, there's all, there was already like 600,000 coins, over 600,000 coins in you know, not an ETF, but a, but a trust, basically an ETF for, for, for this discussion. Um, and so if you kind of go up to 700,000, 800,000, 900,000, a million, you're still talking about 5% coins. Um, and so, and, and the higher, the more you get, the more that likely drives price. Um, and that makes it harder to get a bigger share of the network. You can get a more dollar value, but the, the network value is increasing. And so your ability to keep getting a higher percentage of the network into ETFs um, is I think somewhat limited. So I think we'll see a period where that number goes up, that percentage goes up uh, because there's years of pent up demand that, you know, there's all these managed uh, walled garden capital that kind of wants some Bitcoin. So I think when that demand's met, um, it starts to kind of slow down. The, the major threat, um, you know, because it's a proof of work network rather than a proof of stake network, um, it's not so much about transaction censorship and things like that. The main thing would be kind of determining what side wins in like a hard fork or, um, you know, major owners have a, have a kind of an influence on, on that sort of thing. There's an economic push that happens. So it's not that the threat is zero, but instead I would say basically there already were several hundred thousand coins in the centralized entities. Even, you know, um, when you take in other things like Coinbase, there's, there's more than that, but there's still the minority. So it's a large minority of coins are in these kind of big centralized honeypots. And that this might slightly increase them, but not enough. Like if you're if you weren't worried about 15% of coins being held in big institutions, 20% is not going to be the game changer, most likely, right? Or 600,000 coins in in ETF specifically going up to a million or billion point two, right? That's that's not what changes things. So uh, overall, I think that risk is somewhat overblown. Even though I I am glad that people are talking about it. And a point that I've made is. You know, I think the ETFs, they, they, it's understandable that they're getting disproportionate coverage right now because, you know, they're they are one of the major new catalysts for demand and therefore price. Um, in terms of importance, I think it's really important to make technologies or enable kind of communities around the world to use Bitcoin. So I've made the point that, for example, these little Bitcoin hubs around the world are really important, right? So at Bitcoin Beach was an early example, um, but now you have Bitcoin Jungle, Bitcoin Akasi. You have conferences popping up in India and Africa and South Korea, and um, you have all these different hubs around the world, these different communities, and some of them are making their own wallets, so they're trying to localize some of their custody, right? Because the worst case scenario would be, you know, all these communities around the world all having coins in Binance, for example, right? One giant international honeypot that is seizable, hackable. You want coins to be more distributed. Uh, and you want you want like you don't want BlackRock or other large institutions being like your top down marketing funnel for Bitcoin. You want on the ground grassroots, um, you know, people understanding Bitcoin and, and sharing to others why they like Bitcoin and making Bitcoin more usable for them, answering their questions. Right. Making it easier to onboard. That's something that has to happen at the grassroots level. And over the past few years, it has been happening. And I think any technology or any amplification of what they're doing is, is probably the single most important thing relative, you know, compared to the ETFs. Um, but I don't really view the ETFs as a threat either. I think if, if Bitcoin has a problem from the ETF, then Bitcoin was never really worth caring about to begin with. There was some rehypothecation, and that's what Lynn Alden means. It's important to be aware of any risks to financial assets, which is why we prefer FTX, approximately $1.8 billion in short Bitcoin positions. There were other entities facing similar challenges, so Lynn believes that was a contributing factor. She also considers that another potential factor is the situation across the board, diversified across various types of investments. Was there excessive speculation? Equities were soaring across the board, resembling a speculative mania, particularly fond of unprofitable tech stocks and meme stocks. We all recognized that trend, and then it naturally expanded into the altcoin realm. This is a recurring phenomenon in every cycle, but the recent segment was particularly noisy. 
According to Lynn Alden, the rise of altcoins may have had a greater impact on dampening Bitcoin's peak than individual entities. If you learned something from this video, then please like this video and subscribe our channel Everyday Finance, and we will meet in next video. Thanks.